Hi friends, Christy Teji here, your host for the Productive Passions Podcast. Let me ask you, is there something different you dream of doing, but don't know where to begin? If you're feeling suffocated, anxious, or you feel there's something different calling you, come along with me for candid conversations with people who have embarked on a journey to put their passions to work for them. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Life is too short to stay stuck. Hi, friends. Today, I am speaking with Atticus LeBlanc, founder and CEO of PadSplit, to uncover how his innovative platform is revolutionizing the way we think about housing. What if part of the solution of the affordable housing crisis is sitting right inside your home? As rising rent prices squeeze communities and millions struggle to find affordable options, Pad Split steps in, offering homeowners a chance to turn extra space into real housing solutions while earning extra income. Atticus pulls no punches as he explains how outdated zoning laws aren't just obstacles. They may even violate constitutional rights. He passionately calls for action at every level to dismantle these barriers and create room for innovative solutions like PadSplit. You'll hear firsthand how this platform is already creating opportunities for thousands of people leveraging unused housing space to offer a creative, scalable response to the housing crisis. But it's not just about policy and profits. Atticus opens up about the core beliefs and values that drive him as a serial entrepreneur and his unwavering commitment to make a difference. If you've ever wondered what it really takes to launch a mission-driven business, this episode is packed with inspiration and actionable insights. Get ready to be inspired by the stories of people whose lives have been changed and to rethink what's possible in today's housing market. This discussion couldn't be more timely as communities everywhere grapple with the challenges of affordable housing. You are the founder and CEO of PadSplit, but you've done a lot of things before you started that, Um, a bit of a serial entrepreneur. Can you tell me about PadSplit and a little bit of what led you to becoming the founder and CEO of PadSplit? Sure. Uh, yeah, in, in a nutshell, uh, PadSplit is, is a platform that provides access to rooms in shared homes uh, for the 50% of people who can't otherwise afford their rent. Uh, and we earn money by taking a fee from the providers of, of those homes and facilitating all of those interactions between the two sides of, of that marketplace. Uh, so we, we fill the rooms and it's kind of like Airbnb for affordable housing in some ways, uh, where we fill those rooms for, uh, for providers of, of housing. We collect all the payments and then we manage a lot of the interactions that happen inside the homes. And we build a lot of technology to facilitate all those interactions and build trust and, and accountability. So you're just another Airbnb or Verbo. Uh, not exactly. No. Uh, so for, for us, it really is, uh, centered on the question of do the workers who are serving in your communities deserve an opportunity to live there? And so it's generally longer term in nature. Minimum stay is 31 days. These are not people who are taking vacations by any stretch. Uh, this is, uh, as you think about uh, anyone who works in retail, anyone who works at the airport, anyone who works at most hotels, your delivery drivers, your Uber drivers, uh, most of those roles don't really pay enough to be able to afford an individual apartment in almost any city in America. And so the, the problem that we solve, and, and of course, I think we're, we're all probably seeing more and more homelessness uh, around us. But what a lot of people don't recognize is that even folks who are full time employed are often confronting homelessness. And so we are the, the first step on the housing ladder for individuals who are going through any type of transitional period, entering the job market, moving to a new town, uh, or who, who frankly just want to save money for some future goal. Uh, and this is, this is the, the platform that they generally come to to find affordable, flexible housing options uh, with very low barriers to entry. There's no upfront deposits. 
uh, no minimum credit scores. Uh, we're just much more flexible in, in terms of who, who can access the housing. So what I'm hearing you say the differences are is I'm looking for vacation. That's more the Airbnb or the Verbo type um, exactly. apps. You guys are, are really out there to solve a problem. Yeah, we're, we're I mean, the, the mission of the company is to help solve the affordable housing crisis one room at a time. So how is that received by the communities that you're in? Uh, it really depends on the community, to be honest with you. Uh, in, in some cases, it's it's extremely well. In other cases, as you might imagine, uh, unfortunately, there are communities who don't want people living in their neighborhoods who are also the the essential workers in those neighborhoods. And uh, we, we still deal with a lot of discrimination uh, around the country. So uh, uh, some communities are very welcoming and, and others are not. I think it's probably more of a person to person question than it is sure. even an individual community. Uh, so if you could describe a little bit more the type of people that are utilizing the service, you said uh, people like uh, delivery drivers or, or people who work in hotels. Um, it sounds a little bit like it could be um, people entering the middle class or even middle class themselves. Or I think about people who have gone through changes recently where maybe they had their own home, but for some reason, whether divorce or something else, yeah. Um, that impacts that, that takes that, that, that position in society away or takes their home away. Are you, do you see those kind of people utilizing pad split? Absolutely. There, there are three broad groups of, of folks. Uh, and, and for context, when I'm first moved to Atlanta, when I was 22 and just trying to get my feet under me, didn't really know anything about the city. I, I actually rented a room here back in 2002 for, for the first six months I was I was in town uh, to to try to establish myself. So I think that's probably one group. It's, if people are new to town or they're uh, graduate students or graduating students and literally just getting just getting started, just getting started is is one segment of people. Uh, then you have another another group that's broadly between the ages of. 25 and 55 that uh, uh, in some cases have been through a life change, as you noted, divorce, medical issue, car accident, et cetera. Uh, and they need a reset for, for whatever reason. Um, and then uh, in that same group, you have folks who, who frankly just don't earn enough. They live usually on their own, but they don't earn enough to be able to qualify for uh, an apartment on on their own. And, and when apartments uh, require $65,000 a year in income just to qualify, well, it, it's it's certainly reasonable that there's going to be a huge portion of the population who just doesn't earn enough to, to qualify. And then the last group are uh, anyone on fixed income. So uh, seniors, particularly seniors living alone, uh, anyone on disability income, and those folks who also fall into a similar bucket and that they, it's probably not enough to qualify for uh, uh, for an apartment. Uh, but in some cases, they do have savings. They're just uh, they don't want to drain their savings to be able to, to afford a place to live. It's about a third of our users uh, transfer from one unit to another. It's actually a, a huge benefit of the platform is that we have a network of more than 14,000 options around the country. Uh, and so. Uh, if if you decide, let's say you're you're in Florida, you want to check out Las Vegas, uh, well, you can do that pretty seamlessly. And because all utilities are included, each room is fully furnished. It's just much more flexible and uh, makes moving or exploring, uh, particularly if you are mobile, to to be able to to pull that off. What about organizations? Again, because where I live, I can think of um, several. I live near the Space Center in Florida. And there are lots of companies that bring people out for months at a time. They're not necessarily looking to put somebody up in a hotel for three months. Is that another option for a company if they were interested? We have, we have absolutely seen that. We've seen that from uh, largely construction companies, uh, some uh, medical services companies where they, they have uh, either nurses or nurses aides 
Uh, there's a, um, there's a school actually in Florida. That's a welding school that kind of does something similar as well, where they put people through a training or apprenticeship program. Uh, so yeah, it, it is, it is something that we've, we've certainly seen. We don't have a ton of, um, of dedicated corporate partnerships, but we, we would absolutely love to love to have more. So let me flip things a little bit and ask about, um, the, the, owners of homes who are the people that are opening their homes up to to rent out a room are they typically living in the home or do they rent out all of their rooms in most cases they're renting out all of the rooms and so as, as you might imagine uh two very different customer segments if if you own a rental property there's really one thing primarily that you care about and that is what is your cash flow what is your yield and uh Whereas if you are a homeowner, you care about a lot more than just what is what is the yield uh, when you're running out rooms. You want to know, OK, what hours are you keeping? Um, what you know, are you going to use the kitchen regularly? Uh, all sorts of different things well beyond the scope of am I going to earn more money? And so as a result, we certainly see the vast majority of our customers on the host side that are. Uh, owners of investment properties. So generally, it's uh, a single or, or or couple people who together own a rental property or handful, uh, and they recognize here is a, here is a way that we can actually create more affordable housing that is accessible to the workforce, and we want to do something good, and it actually makes more money for us. Uh, but both of those things have to be true, and and usually what I say is. They come for the income and stay for the impact. Uh, so we have historically been able to demonstrate that the net operating cash flow from the properties under this model uh, is about 2x greater than, than what it would be under a traditional rental. Wait, wait, wait. That's double. That's correct. Yes. So, so let, me, let me just repeat that. If I have a house with three or four bedrooms... Instead of renting out the house to one family, if I considered renting the rooms, there's potential to make double what I would have just renting the house. Correct. Yeah. And and that's not that's not anything that we did, by the way, that I mean, the fractionalization model has always existed. Uh, This type of housing, actually, a lot of people don't know, has existed for centuries. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, Ben Franklin. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, all, all rented rooms. Yeah. Uh, but even well before that, this was, this was a thing. Before pad split. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're, we're old, but we're not, uh, we're not revolutionary old. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the reason why the pricing model works the way that it does is it's kind of like fractionalization of anything. When you go to a restaurant and it's a la carte, it generally costs more than if you ordered the, the combo. Uh, and in in housing, the first bedroom is really the only one that is truly market value. There's the highest uh, price per square foot on the first bedroom, a studio apartment or a one bedroom apartment. Whereas uh, a two bedroom is not worth two one bedrooms. Uh, and the third bedroom is worth less. The fourth bedroom is worth less. The fifth bedroom is worth less. And so if, if you're looking at houses, the difference in cost whether for rent or purchase between a four bedroom house and a five bedroom house, you'll notice is, is really nothing significant where, where that provides an opening for this fractionalization model is to say, okay, well, if I'm renting by the room, the first bedroom can be priced much lower than quote unquote market rate. It's much lower than what a studio would cost about half or less in some cases uh, of what that would cost. But the second bedroom in that house is worth the exact same as the first. The third is worth the same as the first, fourth, fifth, sixth, et cetera. So uh, what happens is you reach this tipping point from an economics perspective where you're better off renting by the room than renting the entire property. In single family homes, that usually happens around four bedrooms uh, where you're better off renting by the room. And then in in an apartment setting, uh, it usually happens between two to three, uh, where you're better off renting by the room 
uh, versus renting the entire apartment. And so it, it seems counterintuitive, but the model can both produce more income while also being much more affordable for someone who's looking for uh, a single bedroom. So let's say I have a house that has a guest room mm-hmm. and prices are going up. It's getting expensive for me to stay in my home. I, I can't move out, but I have this room available. Is that something that um, we can talk about? And if so, how does pad split screen potential renters to make sure that I've got somebody who's going to be compatible with the way that I live? Yeah, so so it's absolutely something that that I think is worth considering and uh, is a real use case for a lot of people. Actually, the room that I am in right now, uh, I rented to someone through the Padsplit platform uh, who initially was a waitress. She got her teaching degree and became a teacher and eventually moved out. It was three years. She lived in this room for for three years. Um, so it's it's certainly something that that can be done and can can generate revenue to help offset any any costs for you as a homeowner. And we we're starting to see that more and more actually as home prices continue to rise. But uh, from a screening perspective, there are three three things that Padsplit does. One, there's an initial background screening uh, for just criminal history over the last seven years. Um, there is an identity verification process where to apply, you you have to hold a picture of your ID and there's uh, some software that scans your face relative to the photo on your ID to make sure that you are who you say you are. Uh, and then there's income verification that we, we want to make sure that that person actually has verifiable income that is sufficient to be able to cover the cost uh, of that unit. And so that's what we do. Uh, then let's say you want to gauge compatibility. Uh, you have the ability to approve or deny anyone who wants to apply to live in your home. Uh, And so at that point, you can do any additional screening that you would like. You can interview them. uh, You can meet them in person. uh, You can run additional background checks should you choose, talk to their employers, and anything that that you would want to do to make sure that uh, this is a person who is complementary with however you live. So I could... I could say, um, yes, I have this room, but I'm only interested in having people between these ages with no pet, no cigarette smoker, no that sort of thing. Yeah, you can certainly customize exactly what you're what you're looking for in the description of of the room that you were looking for a single roommate. And this is the only room in your house. uh, And here is here is your ideal customer that you're looking for. Interesting. Affordable housing right now is a big topic of political debate. Is pad split positioned to help alleviate some of those challenges or to to enter the conversation? No question. No question. It's why we exist. Uh, I I mean, you had mentioned in the intro that I've, I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. Most of that has been in the housing, in the affordable housing space. So I have had significant experience in all facets of affordable housing over the last 15 years, uh, whether that is the voucher program, tax credits, uh, partners with uh, the city of Atlanta and other jurisdictions on building new affordable housing projects or renovating new affordable housing projects as well. Uh, And so it is my area of expertise. I'm not a technology person in any way, shape or form. I just... Uh, I came from the housing background and decided that we needed to solve this problem. But so that is that is the the reason the company exists. Uh, and I think as a as a testament to what we've been able to achieve over the last six years, we've created more than fourteen thousand units of housing and, and housed over thirty two thousand people across the country. Uh, with a, how a many? Uh, thirty two thousand is is what we're up to. Wow. Um, and uh, th- that spokes with a median income of $27,000 a year. And, and the reason that number is relevant is it means that there's, there's almost no scenario where that median income is going to qualify for an apartment in the areas where we operate. Uh, and we've done it without any public dollars at all. No taxpayer dollars have gone into the creation of this model. The thesis of starting the company and the way that we're organized, the way that we are, and and also why we are a public benefits corporation, uh, meaning that we have this public good in mind, uh, is that uh, 
I believed that the, the best way to solve the affordable housing shortage was by demonstrating to the housing providers of the world that they could actually get a higher return by creating affordable housing than whatever it was that they were doing before that was not affordable or accessible. Uh, and so the two problems that we are directly positioned to solve, one is the supply of housing. I think probably most of your listeners have, have heard this question around uh, or read in the paper about the lack of housing supply. Right. And we're suffering from a, a, a lack of sufficient housing supply to be able to meet demand. The second piece, which almost no one talks about, is the access question, meaning what does it take to qualify for any of existing or new units? Uh, what is the minimum income? Uh, what is the minimum deposit? What is the minimum credit score, et cetera? And unfortunately, what happens even in new, sometimes I'll, I'll use air quotes, affordable uh, projects, those barriers to entry are so high that they can't actually serve the people that they need to, or the application requirements themselves and the application process is so slow uh, that they can't meet the need as effectively as we all hope that they would be able. And so those are the two problems that we help to solve. The supply question we solve because you're talking about empty rooms in existing homes. And there are more than enough empty bedrooms across the country to be able to meet the, the gap, which is quoted to be 7 million uh, affordable homes. Uh, and you could do that with just a very tiny fraction of, of existing homes that are, that are already built today. And so, of course, that's much faster, much cheaper to be able to do. And then on the access question, pad split doesn't require any upfront deposit. We don't require any minimum credits or uh, and so you can move into a room on average for two hundred and sixty five dollars total. Uh, and and obviously, that's a much lower barrier to entry than than any other housing option. So, oh gosh, I have so many questions and thoughts running through my head. It's one of the things that strikes me is that you're taking this this issue and it's a big issue, right? It's it's a crisis for some people and it can be controversial right? Affordable housing, how we pay for it, how we take care of people can be really controversial. But you're saying, wait a minute, there's a way that we can do this. People can make money on it. You're not taking government funds and not that there's not a place for that, but you're not taking government funds and you're providing an opportunity for people to maybe escape homelessness or even if that's not a consideration, to be able to move into a safe, secure place and save money to be able to then afford their own place. Exactly. It's, it's both and. And I mean, listen, I have been personally moved and really feel privileged to be able to do what I do because I've seen people who have been functionally homeless, either living in their car or in a motel, even though they're working full time. Uh, but that have through pad split gone on to not just save up enough money to get their own place, in some cases, start their own businesses, in some cases, buy their own houses, in some cases, buy their own houses, and then turn those back into pad splits and create those opportunities again. So uh, it's, uh, it's been really, it's been really beautiful to, to see and, and to be able to be a part of. So Atticus, why this? Because I, I've looked at your background and you could have just, you could have gone into housing and development and made huge amounts of money. And I don't know, maybe you are making huge amounts of money, but, but you're, you're really addressing the needs of a part of the population that can be desperate, that can feel desperate, that don't have huge dollars that you could be making huge, huge returns, but you, you figured this out, but what, why Atticus? Why this? Why do you care about affordable housing? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, Christy. I mean, and uh, my my personal housing story. I told you that when I moved to Atlanta, I I rented room for for the first uh, six months I was here. I was making thirty thousand dollars a year, and uh, because of it was a totally different mortgage market. It was a totally different real estate market. After I rented that room, when I went to go look at qualifying for an apartment, uh, I toured some 
crappy apartments that were in my price range. And I realized uh, fairly quickly, wait a second, I can actually buy a house, even though I don't have great credit and I'm only earning $30,000 a year, I could buy a house in 2003. Uh, and from the time that I realized I could buy a house to the time that I was under contract was five days. So it was super, super fast. And the decision was made largely just on a whim. But that decision changed the trajectory of the rest of my life and my entrepreneurial career. And because I started building equity in that house, I was able to borrow against it and quit my job right before I got married in 2005. Uh, I was able to borrow against that house when I lost all my income in 2007 and actually start buying houses on my own in 2008. Um, And none of that would have been possible had I not rented that room and then figured out I could buy a house. Uh, And when I look at the population that we serve today, if if it were me today, exact same position, and I moved to Atlanta, I was making $30,000 a year. There's no way that I would have had the same opportunity to buy a house earning $30,000 a year with a 599 credit score uh, that I did in 2003. And so when I got to a point in my career where I had absolutely established the financial independence that I wanted to because in part I had bought this house and and then leveraged uh, my own earnings and savings and just blood, sweat and tears into building businesses from 2005 through 2016, I got to the point where I was like, okay, well, I don't need to do more for personal gain. My family is fine. I'm, I'm blessed in every way I can imagine. Uh, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And the answer to that question was, I wanted to create a legacy for sustainable good. And uh, it had to be something that I could step away from. So when I, when I, may sustain, when I, mean, when I say sustainable, what I mean is that I want it to be something that can continue on to the future so that my kids and my hopefully future grandkids and and their kids can look back and say, okay, well, it's great that these opportunities exist uh, and that uh, that I I was a part of creating them. But I hope that's true for millions of other people as well. And I felt um, uniquely positioned given my own experience and the fact that I was acutely aware of the housing issue and all of the things that played into it where I had value that I could add to helping solve this problem in a way where I didn't have the same value offering elsewhere. Uh, and so it, it really just kind of became my life's work truly. Uh, and something that, uh, that I thought this, this could be how I can make a difference uh, individually. This episode isn't about homelessness. However, the things that we're talking about are very close to homelessness. The people who make $30,000 a year, and there still are people who are making $30,000 a year and trying to, to live off of that, trying to have a home, trying to have a safe place to live. Pad split, it seems, can be a solution to homelessness for a lot of people who can't come up with the deposit for the apartment, forget the house, for the apartment, for anywhere. That's such a big need. When we hear about homelessness, it brings to mind for a lot of people a certain image of an individual. However, I know that not to be the case. There are a lot of single parents um, that are homeless because of some of the reasons that, that we talked about. So if I'm a single mom with a couple kids in school, might there be a, a pad split available for me to move my children into with me? Pad split can absolutely be a solution for homelessness. Uh, and to your point about the, the, the image that most people have of homelessness, I, I'm not sure that most of America understands how big the invisible population of homelessness is. Uh, and that you literally run into people every single day in your daily life, whether you are at the grocery store, at a restaurant, um, 
at the airport, taking an Uber, uh, people that are functionally homeless. They are living in their cars. They are staying in extended stay motels. They are couch surfing from, from friend to friend or family member to family member because they do not have a place to live. Uh, and we know that 40% of the population that comes to pad split uh, has been functionally homeless at some point in the last two years, 40%. So it is, it is a massive number uh, and it is largely invisible. Uh, I mean, I'll never forget a story of, of a woman who was a security guard at Emory Hospital uh, and had been homeless for three months while, while working. Uh, and I, I just have this vision of wealthy physicians walking by this woman every single day, not having any idea uh, that while they are dedicated to caring for patients, that here is someone that they probably interact with regularly. Uh, that is suffering in their midst. And, uh, and that, that happens every day. And, and unfortunately, that population is getting larger and larger uh, right now. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. And, and I think uh, with regard to home ownership, and a lot of people talk about first time home buyers and, and just path to wealth. And I think that's absolutely Im- an important thing to recognize. Again, it was, it was part of what, what changed my life and career tra- trajectory overall. Uh, but the, the, it starts with the first step. And someone needs a point of entry. And most of the folks who live with us, uh, certainly the ones who move in, are not at all thinking about home ownership. And, and for, for a lot of people, uh, it's, it's just so far off to even dream about that, that it's like, talk to me about today. Talk to me about getting a roof over my head today and enough food to eat today uh, where I can just relax and know that I can go to work, come home, actually have a home to come home to uh, that is reasonably safe, clean, and quiet. That's it. And, and like that, like watching that set in for people where just you can see the relief on their faces and usually flood of tears uh, in, in many cases, uh, that has to happen. That has to exist before you, you can consider home ownership, right? You can't swing a baseball bat while standing in a canoe. Uh, and so like, let's get people stable first and then, and then we can move forward. Uh, and then to your last question around just uh, different family types, couples, uh, parents with, with children, et cetera. So we're a marketplace and we have lots of different listings from all types of owners. At the end of the day, it's, it depends on uh, what type of property that owner has. And uh, you can imagine a scenario where like if four people are sharing a bath, four bedrooms are sharing a bathroom, uh, it, it's going to be less appropriate for families than it would be if one had uh, a a unit with a private bathroom or maybe even a separate accessory dwelling unit. Uh, and so we really rely on uh, the host to be able to make those determinations based often on on what the local codes are uh, around occupancy uh, and or whether or not it's appropriate for the actual space, right? And and I think. Most listeners would probably agree. Well, yeah, and I don't know that a um, a parent should be leaving an underage child uh, in a home with a shared bathroom where other people, other adults that you don't necessarily know, are living there, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, can you make accommodations when you have a uh, a private bathroom with a separate entry? Okay, well, those are very different circumstances. Uh, and our platform tries to accommodate all of those circumstances. Uh, and at the end of the day, we, we have a philosophy that the people who are closest to the problems are generally the best equipped to solve them. And our job is to provide the tools, the information, and frankly, the incentives so that those people can, can address those problems as appropriately as, as possible. What are the biggest challenges that the organization faces? Wow, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> how much how much time do you have, Chris? Uh, the, as much uh, time as it takes. Yeah, so I, I think uh, listen any 
any entrepreneurial journey is incredibly difficult. Building any business is incredibly difficult. Uh, our business is particularly complex in that we don't control the product. Literally, we we sit between owners of homes and people who want to rent those homes. We are remote. Uh, we are a, a, a effectively a technology marketplace. So we are not on the ground uh, to be able to solve problems for people. So what we can do is provide tools, information, resources, uh, and incentives so that they have the capacity to, to address those issues. Sometimes that's just, if it's a maintenance issue, connecting the renter that has the maintenance issue with the owner or their maintenance technician and making sure that that happens as seamlessly as possible. So uh, lots of just complexity generally in building a business like this, that is a two-sided marketplace. Uh, but also it's a two-sided marketplace where we are in the lives of thousands of individuals every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And those individuals are often living with other people that they don't know. So, so you can imagine the, it, just the number of different scenarios that we, we come across and that we have to accommodate in order to uh, address those in a timely and acceptable manner and then, and then be able to scale that type of organization across the country. Um, so I, I say the operations and just the, the both people management, like organizational management and, and customer management is, is probably the single most difficult thing. Uh, but then again, we also have these regulatory issues <laughs> where, uh, there, there are a lot of outdated zoning laws that I also think most of America is not aware of. Let's talk about that because after you and I had an initial conversation, um, I, I did a little bit of research and found one of the zoning issues, and I'm sure there's money. It relates to how many people live in a house that are not related, that there is a zoning issue around having people that are not related living together. Is that, is that a common zoning issue? It is. It's, it's, it's very common. And I think what, what's logical and what most people assume is that uh, we have zoning laws in place uh, or occupancy laws in place to prevent overcrowding, right? To prevent uh, excessive use of uh, infrastructure, whether that's sewer lines or roads or uh, just making sure that the house is safe from a fire perspective. Um, Zoning doesn't have anything to do with any of those things. Right? <laughs> Building code, fire code, health and safety code, those all exist to govern the occupancy uh, and the, the strain on infrastructure. Zoning sits on top of those that is completely distinct and often arbitrary. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So, so I live in metropolitan Atlanta. In the metro area of Atlanta, uh, Atlanta is just one city, relatively small city among dozens. We have 83 different local jurisdictions, cities and counties. We also have 83 different definitions of family. And when zoning said, when zoning defines family and who's allowed in a single family residence, uh, it, the way that they define that term is based on blood relationship, usually. Uh, it's either blood relationship or, in some cases, domestic servitude, if you can believe it. That is still present in an in a enormous number of zoning codes across. What the is country. what is the definition of domestic servitude? It's a great question, uh, and I don't I don't have I don't have a, a great answer because I haven't found one in the code. Um, but you're in you're in Florida. I'll pick on Jacksonville for a second. The, the definition of family in the city of Jacksonville is up to two unrelated persons, uh, but as many domestic servants as you want. Oh. Yeah. But, but in no case, no more than five unrelated persons. So, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, do you have to prove, do you have to have evidence that these people work for you? You've got your gardener, your cook, your, I mean, you could... I yeah. don't know. It sounds like potential for a lot of loopholes. 
Uh, well, there, there, there are a number of loopholes, but there's also this thing called the Constitution. <laughs> and uh, most of these zoning laws it, are, are violating the Constitution. I mean, freedom of association is right up there with freedom of speech under the First Amendment. And there's no reason why anyone has been able to explain to me that if you can have, let's say, 27 people that are related by blood living in a 2,000 square foot house that you can't have six that happen to be unrelated. Like there's no difference in occupancy, any sort of burden on infrastructure uh, between someone who's related by blood or not. So it has nothing to do with overcrowding. Um, it has to do with with character, right? And, and whether or not uh, we want or, or believe that uh, everyone should be related by blood. Here's, here's part of the problem, though, and what's changed over time, aside from domestic servitude, whatever, however you want to define it, is that family sizes, household makeup have changed dramatically since many of those codes were written 100 plus years ago. Uh, today in the United States, uh, the largest segment of all households are single people living alone. Wait, say that again. The largest segment of all U.S. households are single people who are living alone. So we have more unattached single individuals than we have ever had. Uh, and it is the largest segment of the U.S. population. That was not at all assumed when people decided that they were going to institute single family zoning to comprise 75 percent of most metropolitan areas. So what what happens is and the reason why we have a lot of the housing crisis that we do today is because we built and zoned a lot of large single family homes that have only been getting larger right they were like 500 square feet on average in 1950 now the average is 2500 square feet give or take so huge change in home size meanwhile family and household sizes have become have been coming down uh, for literally 200 plus years. And so we have more and more singles uh, and couples and fewer and fewer large families uh, and these outdated zoning laws that still say, oh, well, you can have an absolutely massive family with 25 children in this thousand square foot house, but you can't have, uh, in some cases, any more than two people who are unrelated. So, yeah, if, if you move in and you've got a girlfriend or a boyfriend uh, and a roommate, like you are non-compliant and subject to criminal, <laughs> criminal uh, citation in those cases. And so I think most of America just is not aware that we could solve the housing crisis that we have right now if if we just re-looked at the the existing space we've already created and uh, got rid of some of these ancient zoning laws that were always intended to be discriminatory and, and they are doing their job. So what or who will it take to change these outdated codes? What needs to happen? Uh, I mean, there are a couple of things. I mean, certainly uh, cities could change them on their own. That's, that's usually very difficult, though, uh, because more often than not, the people who uh, are are trying to protect the codes or don't want them to change are are often large voting constituencies. Uh, we we saw uh, a really successful example of new legislation come out of Colorado recently, uh, where they passed a bill that essentially says what I think everybody already assumes that uh, occupancy is limited to health, safety, and fire code, and a city in the state of Colorado cannot arbitrarily limit based on blood relationship, which, which seems, again, super obvious that, oh, well, why wouldn't we tie occupancy to the square footage of a home? Why should you be able to have the same number of people in a thousand square foot home versus a 10,000 square foot home? Uh, that doesn't make any sense logically to anyone that I'm aware of. Um, but so so that that state of Colorado example uh, is probably the, the biggest that was uh, HB two four one zero zero seven. And when was that? You said that was recently. 
That was recently. So the governor, uh, Jared Polis of, uh, of Colorado, signed that this summer. I just met him last week, by the way. Okay, He's great. making some changes. Yeah, well, uh, well, yeah, bring those changes to, to Florida because uh, I, I, I know there are a huge number of, of singles, particularly uh, aging in place in Florida uh, compared to elsewhere in the country. So it could, it could make a huge difference there. But not only that, as you've been talking about it, and you brought up Jacksonville specifically, you know what's really big in Jacksonville? The military. Yeah, yeah. And there are a lot of single people that are active duty that have bought homes that could utilize pad split when they're on deployment. I know this personally. I bring this up because I know this this um, is a personal situation. Um for one young man in particular that I know who is going to be deployed, he's got a house and he's trying to figure out what am I going to do to keep my house safe? And, you know, and what a perfect opportunity. But according to what you're saying, the codes in Jacksonville are going to prevent that, um, that use of pad split unless it's just one person coming in. I, I should, I should, uh, uh, I should give a caveat that we have 1,400 units in Jacksonville. So <laughs> uh, we um, are they compliant? Uh, so th- the short answer is yes, uh, but it it requires a different interpretation. And so the way that we fight a lot of these rules is how do you define? You asked how you define domestic servant earlier. How do you define person? And In most cases, person is actually defined on a statewide level versus family, which is defined on a local level. Also a little bit crazy that we couldn't agree, at least either on a statewide or national basis, what constitutes a family or a person. But um, but yeah, the way person is defined is it's inclusive of of a corporation. And uh, so if a corporation can be a person. And we create a, a separate leasehold entity that is that is the the tenant of the owner. Uh, then they're only ever renting to one person. And uh, as you know, you can uh, have members of the corporation, uh, and that's that's not necessarily a limitation. So uh, there is there is a single leasehold entity, and then the residents actually become members of that that corporation uh and have temporary use of the of the home so let me let me put what we just talked about into a scenario correct me if i'm wrong we've got this house in jacksonville that's owned by an active uh military uh individual who is deployed deployed Mm -hmm. for three years or 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 um assigned to another area for three years in those three years, that house could be used to house that that residence could be used to house nurses, um, Amazon employees, truck drive, whatever. Any those kind of employees that need a place to stay, then the house is occupied and relatively protected because people are living there, maintained during those three years that uh, the individual who owns the house is living in another part of the world or country serving our country. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and And that's not an exaggeration, right? No, that's, that's, you're absolutely right. Okay. Uh, I mean, we've thought about it for my own house. Uh, I have, so I have four kids. Um, But uh, my my wife and I have, have talked about the day we become empty nesters and uh, we don't want to necessarily give up the house, but what do you do uh, if we want to go out and travel? And yeah, it's a lot easier to just, you leave all your furniture in place, you rent individual rooms and there's some accountability that happens just because you have different stakeholders sharing sharing the space. So not one person controls everything and uh, they, they certainly hold each other accountable to a large degree. Uh, and you can send in biweekly cleaning crews as well to, to just keep everything in in order as opposed to handing over the keys to the house to someone that maybe you trust a little bit but you don't really know uh, and and so yeah we we can certainly see that that use case happening uh, more and more often and then the other piece is it, talking about just the service in general the people who generally live in pad split homes 
are the people who are already working in your communities. And, and I find great irony in the fact that some of the neighbors who say, well, I don't want those people living in our neighborhood. It's literally the person who is serving, who is cutting your meat at the grocery counter. <laughs> and, and so like you trust them to like hand you your food, uh, but you don't want them living in your neighborhood uh, or, or they're, they're the security guard or the police officer in some cases or the teacher. Uh, or the daycare worker who's literally caring for your children, but you not don't. in my backyard. Yeah, not not in your backyard. Uh, let's 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 think this through. You know, another scenario I had pop into my head as we're talking is again. I live in Florida. We have snowbirds. There are so many houses, especially around where I live, that are boarded up yeah. for six months out of the year. And I also talked to friends recently that were selling their house because they couldn't afford to maintain two houses anymore. But if I'm boarding up my house and going to my other house for six months, since it's 30 day commitment, I could say for three of those six months, I want to rent out those space, rent, rent out one or more of the rooms in my house. Mm -hmm. Do you have that? Do you have people who are, who are snowbirds that are, you know what? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, it's certainly a possibility, but I'm not sure of that specific use case. Uh, if we have anyone who's who's actually doing that, like I said, we we, we have a decent number of owner occupants. Most are uh, just the real estate investors, mom and pop type folks who have uh, one or a couple rental properties. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, some of those may have been converted from vacation homes as well. It's it certainly makes sense, uh, particularly if you can. What we do see sometimes is where they will rent out a portion of the home to the platform, but not the whole thing. And so then it's it's easier to to come and go either personally or uh, maybe they they're renting a, an accessory dwelling unit in the backyard or something like that as well. I want to talk about you a little bit more. Okay. What is your mantra? When things get really tough, it sounds like you've got a really mm. tough job. What is your go-to mantra? One foot in front of the other. That's that's easy. Yeah, the comp the company the company mantra is one room at a time, and so uh, that's uh, that's largely based on uh, my own personal mantra of uh, literally just put one foot in front of the other, keep moving forward, uh, and I've I've been I've been in business long enough to see the highs and the lows and that this truly is a roller coaster, uh, uh, both, uh, emotionally and, uh, intellectually and just from a, from a physical, uh, exertion standpoint as well, uh, that, that certainly takes a toll and, and you have to recognize, uh, when you are, when you're high, when you're low and that, uh, understand that neither of those conditions are permanent. Uh, and that, uh, yeah, the, sometimes the only way forward is through. You know, I like that you say that, um, I'm a runner and, and one of the things that we say a lot of times is slow is a pace. Mm. So it's, it really is the same one foot in front of the other. Some days you may be faster than other days. And so it sounds to me like you're saying the same thing is just keep moving forward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, listen, um, we, we do what we can. I'd say the other, um, the other is, is, um, some, some version of the St. Michael's prayer. If you're familiar with it, I was, uh, uh, still am Catholic and, uh, educated in Catholic school and it's, uh, God grant me the, uh, the strength to change the things I can, uh, or the courage to change the things I can the strength to accept the things I cannot and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, and so understand, understand where you are. Wow. That's, that's really appropriate. Uh, what's a little known fact about you? Another little known fact about you. Oh, another little known fact. Um, yeah, I've got, um, uh, a lot of stupid human tricks, you know, prided myself on stupid human tricks as a kid. Okay. Like, <laughs> you can't you can't leave us hanging what's one of your um, stupid human tricks yeah i mean i can i can i can wiggle my ears uh i can uh i can whistle through my tongue uh 
So yeah, there's there's okay. Now we we got to have examples of those too. Under too much information, probably for the podcast, <laughs> Christy. But uh, but yeah, I I uh, I used to be a champion of superhuman tricks. I love that. So if if this whole like housing thing doesn't work out, you could join a circus. Uh, I don't know about join a circus. I don't think anybody's paying to see any of my stupid human tricks. They're not. They're not that entertaining. But uh, but yeah, if if the pad split thing doesn't work out. Um, probably circles back to one foot in front of the other. I have now written a weekly update for our investors uh, every week for six consecutive years. So uh, I, I think we have enough material to compile a book. So when this journey ends, uh, I'll, I will at least have enough for a book. I will be lining up to get that book, a signed <laughs> copy of that book. What did you want to be when you were 10 years old? An inventor. Yeah, I wanted, uh, anything in particular? I, I just I I, uh, I wanted to be an inventor. Um, I thought uh, I, I had I had a lot of admiration actually for for Benjamin Franklin as a kid, uh, and and He's still a pretty do. cool guy. Yeah, still still do in a lot of ways. Um, and so I, I wasn't I wasn't quite sure how uh, to become a professional inventor, but but that was uh, that was always intriguing. And and I mean, candidly, it's. It's kind of what happened. I was going to say, I don't yeah. think you're that far off. Yeah, this, this it, it's it's not exactly the way that I thought about it, but um, but yeah, I it, I mean, I still really uh, love just the ability to to go from concept to completion, right? To to be able to come up with an idea and to to see it realized. Uh, the vision, of course, for for Pad Split is. Uh, it, probably way too large to even uh, see the quote completion during my lifetime, but, um, but we're, we're going to try. Well, it's a good thing you have four kids then. That's right. <laughs> That's right. For our folks that are listening that want to start their own thing, mm-hmm. what advice would you give? What are, what do you have to do to be able to start your own thing? Whatever that thing is. Um. I think it's it's certainly uh, it's a combination of passion and preparation, and understand that uh, I think everybody wants to follow their passion to some to some degree or another. Yep. Uh, and you also have to recognize what is your superpower relative to everyone else. And I mean, what is yours? For me, it's I think it's creative problem solving actually. Uh, but, but more so than that, it's, uh, the reason I, I have oriented myself towards this space is I think I've always been a natural creative problem solver just as a personality trait, but being close enough, I mean, so close to these problems that I'm, I'm closer to, uh, the, the individual geographies, properties, housing situation, and like every aspect of uh, the the housing system to be able to understand a lot of different complexities and, and interactions and to be able to predict what is likely to happen based on everything that I have seen so far. Uh, and so uh, I'll be honest, I, I think... Um, there's no way there's no way that I could be running this company 15 years ago right I was in a different space personally I'm, I'm still the exact same person that I was 15 years ago uh, but I I had not I was not in a position financially to be able to take the risks that I have taken uh, I would not be able to rely on pad split to be able to provide the type of life for my family that I ultimately wanted to provide. 15 years ago. Uh, and I mean, it is still, it is still a moonshot, right? So, uh, I was not prepared to take the risks that I did at the time. And so I think that's, that's one, um, one prerequisite. The other is just having the experience in becoming a subject matter expert and ensuring that whether I was investing in properties in town, Atlanta, and I had to feel confident that I knew that block, that house, uh, those investments better than anyone else in the world. 
And getting to that level of expertise, I think, ultimately uh, put me in a position where, number one, I was able to, to build a, a financial base to be able to take the risk that I wanted to take. But it also gave me the experience and understanding of the broader system and how, how different pieces of the system interacted with each other uh, and how we could ultimately create a product that added value. Uh, but a lot of people ask me, oh, where'd you get your passion? And I think a lot of that has been accumulated over time, the more that I've come to understand the problem. When I arrived in Atlanta as a 22-year-old, I certainly was in no way thinking, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go solve the affordable housing crisis. Uh, and uh, that, like, both the niche and the passion, and so, so the experience, the preparation, and the passion, I think developed over time. Uh, that that started with just both an idea that okay I see this opportunity back in 2008 2009 uh, and I and and I also recognize just uh, what I would say is like the moral imperative of addressing the the injustice that I saw and felt in that I had no idea until I was 28 years old that you could have a full-time job in this country and not be able to afford anything in terms of a place to live. And, and maybe be called a bum. Yeah. Or, yeah. Exactly. or any of the other names that we call people who, who may be homeless or near homeless or functionally homeless, that you could be doing everything that you know to do. And or anyone that, everything that anyone would expect you to do, right? Even, even under the just, overly simplistic philosophy of pick yourself up by the bootstraps, which is, I, I think, yeah, I, I still absolutely believe in hand up hand, versus hand out, et cetera. Uh, but, but to understand, wait a second, like the opportunity literally does not exist for an enormous portion of the population to be able to pick oneself up by their bootstraps. Uh, and, and for people who are working often one or multiple jobs, full-time jobs, uh, to not be able to qualify for a basic apartment. Uh, that was, that was deeply troubling to me. So it, like that was, that was probably just the, 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 the little prick that kind of got me on this journey. But, uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been a long, long journey. And, and so I think it's, it's a combination of both understanding what your passion is or what it might be and how do you prepare for that? Uh, I tell people like, uh, particularly folks who are, who are visionaries and want to go do something really big. If you're going to go on a whale hunting expedition, make sure you know how to catch minnows along the way because you, you're, you don't want to go whale hunting and starve. <laughs> uh, and it's, and it's super easy to, to, to starve along the way. Well, and I think um, it's easy to look at somebody and go, wow, look at what they're doing, but not understand the journey that has gotten them there. All of those things, like you said, becoming the expert, you had to do a lot of homework. And my guess is you continue to do that to understand things like zoning and all of the just different places and not just zoning, but what are the other impacts of, sure. of doing what you're doing? I have so many questions. I know we're running out of time. Yeah, Please. We want to, to build on that though, Christy. Please. Also recognizing that you can have the greatest passion, you can have the greatest preparation, uh, you can be putting in all the work, and you can still fail. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes you do, and maybe even more often than not, you do. Uh, which is where we circle back to just put one foot in front of the other. And I've certainly had these experiences where uh, you you did everything right and you still end up face down on the floor wondering what the hell happened. Uh, and there's really no other option than picking yourself up and putting one foot in front of the other and, and just doing that over and over again. I'm so glad you brought that up because I will tell you in so many of my conversations, I will say in the vast majority of my conversations, failure comes up. 
But fa- not failure as this horrible thing. Of, of course, certainly it feels like that in the moment. It can feel like that in the moment. But failure in the way to, to look at it, that there's a different direction. So it doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong. It might mean that there's a different direction that you need to take or what you're doing is is not going in the direction that's needed at that time. So I talk about um, personal propellants, things in my life that felt like total failures, that were catastrophes when they happened. But I look back now and thank God that they happened because they absolutely changed the trajectory of the direction I was headed. And it was a necessary thing. Um, And so many people that I talked to talk about failure when they experienced failure, but it really was a propellant to move them in a different direction. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, um, I I think that's absolutely right. Uh, or, or sometimes the same direction (laughs) and, uh, and the, the come to Jesus moment is just, all right, I just have to bang my head against the wall a little bit harder, uh, or I have to accept the fact that, uh, that my, for me, I mean, going on this journey, uh, may ultimately mean that, uh, I am in court personally, uh, fighting these battles and you have to look in the mirror and ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it really worth it? And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I've I've made peace with that, honestly. And um, it, I know we haven't we haven't told a lot of of, of resident stories here, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think about um, I think about a couple very specific personal stories. Uh, one in particular that I know we talked about prior to the the podcast about a woman who uh, had been living in her car. Uh, had but but was working and found out about pad split from a friend where she just needed a place to take a shower and went to take a shower at a friend's place and found out about pad split moved in four years later uh she had proven herself to to her host as a, a capable responsible person who was capable of cleaning ended up starting her own cleaning business now manages the entire portfolio manages uh, uh, manage a construction project for me that I, I didn't even know she was a, pad, a former pad split member, moved into her own place and has this successful business. And this was a profitable endeavor for the host, right? Uh, and so it was, it was a mutually beneficial relationship, but it started with the kernel of an opportunity. And, and so when I'm confronting issues like when I'm in a suit in front of a judge for facing some citation for a house that I don't own uh, is um, and have never even seen in most cases, I think, okay, is, is it worth that kernel of an opportunity that ultimately made this new reality possible for, for that woman? And, and at this point now, the thousands of other people that I know where we have been present as that kernel of an opportunity, and the answer is, if this is if this is the cost, then then that's okay. Wow, I uh, I have a little tagline. I didn't make it up, but I love it. Go make a difference, yeah. and Atticus, you are absolutely making a difference. Thank One you. One last question: Where do you see Pad Split in five years? Um. I, so let's see, five years. The stars align. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I don't know about 2029, but uh, but 2030, I would like to get to a million rooms. I would like to reach a million rooms in in 2030. That's uh, that's my my crazy goal at the moment. Well, I hope that some of the people that are listening get inspired to Red Room. And I'll tell you this: just this week, I had a friend reach out looking for someone who's interested in renting a room where she lives. And I'll tell, I'll tell you, I said, you got to look up this company called pad split. So I think also getting the word out is important. Um, and I know that you're doing that. Are you still looking for investors? Uh, not immediately, but probably next year. So 
Uh, we, I anticipate we will probably do a fundraise next year. We actually just finished uh, some fundraising over the summer. Uh, so we're just kind of in a, in a little bit of a gap there, but, uh, but yeah, certainly we are always talking to investors, put it that way. Okay. And if somebody wanted to reach out to you, what's, where's the best place to go? Yeah. So, uh, if they're looking for pad split, go to padsplit.com. Uh, and if you want to become a host or a member, that is absolutely the best place to go. Otherwise, the best place to find me, I post a fair amount on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, uh, I write a newsletter and uh, just publish a fair amount of content there. So that's probably the easiest place to get in touch with me. Okay. We will have that information in show notes. So if anybody forgets or doesn't know how to spell or what doesn't know how to spell your name or et cetera, those will be in the show notes. Atticus, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for what you're doing to improve housing opportunities for people who may struggle otherwise. Thank you for being a guest. Absolutely. Thank you, Christy. This has really been fun. My pleasure. 